attacker controlled data can contain a um, return oriented program, which can either be a fully return oriented payload that uses all return oriented program to do everything, or it's easier is to just make a return oriented payload stage that just uses ROP to basically evade DEP and then execute a traditional payload. And so that's, um, so that's basically what, I'm, what I do. And there's a variety of ways to do this because uh, DEP does not mean that the application can't allocate more executable memory. So you can just allocate executable memory, copy your payload into it, and execute it from there. Or you can make, what I, what I like doing is I like doing the virtual protect ESP. I just make the stack executable again. <laughs> and it's like, this because this is less code. Just make it executable, go right there. Um, so, you know, it works. So if you have a stack pivot, return onto payload stage, which is reusable, and a normal payload, you know, you can get it at your local convenience store or Metasploit, wherever you want. Um, you have a permanent debt bypass exploit and you're basically done. So what this means is that DEP without ASLR is weak sauce. It's really like, it just makes the attackers work a little bit, but even by the time permanent DEP came out, I mean, it had already been published how to evade it. Um, just to give you an idea of how old this stuff is, like the original uh, return to payload, return to programming paper, I think came out in 2007. Um, and this whole, a lot of this return to programming, you know, return to exploitation stuff had been talked about since 1997. I mean, nothing I'm saying today is anything new at all. I mean, it, everything I talk about is at least two years old. Um, it's just not, hasn't really been put into practice. So without, so basically, you know, ASLR kind of comes in degrees. If you have no ASLR, it's really easy to turn off depth because you have a bunch of material you can use for return-oriented programming. If one or more modules do not opt into ASLR, basically you just confine your search to that module. So if you know that module A is at location X, you just scan that and build your entire return oriented program based on that. If everything opts into ASLR, uh, then it's a little more difficult um, because you're not gonna know where anything is and you're gonna need to use uh, memory address disclosure vulnerabilities or some other tricks to um, kind of figure out where things are and uh, build your return oriented payload. Uh, this was done by, I'm gonna ma massacre his last name, uh, I'll just say Peter, at Pwn to Own this year at Kensei Quest. Sorry? Rubden Hill. Yes, he used, he had a technique to um, not terminate a, uh, a Unicode string, I believe, and so he could read the string, and that would basically give him uh, the V table from an, a, an adjacent object. Once he had that, he could build, he said, oh, this, with this V table, I know it's, I don't know, MSHTML or whatever. I know that MSHTML is at this address, and I can build my return to payload based on that information. So even with full ASLR, not all that uh, secure. Or there's still ways around it. It is secure, but it just makes the, you have to find another vulnerability-like thing. So you have to combine a memory corruption vulnerability with a memory disclosure vulnerability, and then you can actually make use of the corruption vulnerability. So let's talk about putting this into practice to exploit the vulnerability that was exploited in the wild in the Operation Aurora attacks. So. <coughs> So here's basically the, here's the, the crux of the, the, uh, the issue. There's an event param object that is, this is a C++ object, you know, in MSHTML. Um, and when you create, you, when in JavaScript calls create event object with an existing JavaScript event, this event param constructor uh, doesn't increment the reference counts for pointers that it uses. So it has a pointer called source element and it just copies the pointer value and source element is a pointer to the C tree node, and it copies the pointer without incrementing the reference count. This is bad. Um, because, and so, you know, as you go, you have uh, the event param pointing to a C tree node and a, the C element, which is the representation of the HTML element that fired the event, both pointing to the same memory, but only one of them has a reference count. And that's why the C element has the strong arrow and the source element under the event param has the weak arrow. It points to that memory, but because it's not reference counted, it doesn't strongly point to that memory. When, if for instance, you remove the original element from the DOM tree, it'll free that memory and decrement the reference count to the C tree node object. Once, if the C tree node object reference count is zero, which is the normal case because it only had the element pointing to the C tree node, uh, the object will be freed. You know, when, when it gets called to the destructor, it'll say, my reference count is zero, time to free myself. So what that means is you have a use after free situation. An attacker can cause controlled allocations of the right size to replace that object in the heap 
with an object that they fully control. So they have created their own C tree node with fully controlled data that event param points to. And then if you do a virtual, you know, do some calls on that, uh, on that event param and it gets used, it'll j basically jump through memory that you control. It'll do a C++ virtual call using a vtable pointer that you chose. And so how we ex exploit this is our crafted heap block um, will have a pointer to a fake C element and this fake C element is actually where the vtable is. And so C element has a pointer to a forged vtable. And so what an attacker can do is attacker can build all of this in their heap spray. So they can heap spray the heap with a kind of self-referential data structure um, that it just has to uh, satisfy these properties so that the app, when, when Internet Explorer is using it, you know, as the code is written, it'll behave how the attacker wants it to behave. And this vtable will have pointers to other, you know, other code so that when the virtual function call through that vtable happens, it will um, use a pointer value that, uh, that the attacker chose and do a stack pivot using an exchange EAX ESP instruction, <coughs> which will point the stack pointer into the heap, into the heap spray that the attacker point, you know, the attacker created, which will have, you know, what, um, what I call, you know, people either call a ret sled or I like calling them rop knops. Um, and basically they're the address of a return instruction, which basically causes the stack pointer to kind of increment until it hits the return oriented payload stage. And from the return oriented payload stage, allocates memory, blah, 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 blah. So let's see what that looks like. All right, come on. Okay. All right, I sacrificed my goats to the demo gods last night, so let's see what happens. So this is Internet Explorer 8. On Windows Vista 7, it is obviously unpatched for this vulnerability because if I did that, the demo would be very short and very boring. Um, so I just have like a little run exploit button but that calls my JavaScript to actually do the full exploit. And we do that and, oh, how that happened? Got a calculator. Oops, oh crap, I wanted to do some arithmetic. Hit it again, oh okay, there we go. So, boom. Um, it's all it takes. And uh, I already hit it twice. Let's hit it again. <laughs> so you know, everything's moving onto the web. You know, that's one of the things that you know, security people complain about. And pretty soon, you won't actually have a desktop calculator application. And so you'll need to go to an exploit web page to actually launch a calculator for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's basically how it works. Um, so let's talk about. Next slide. Come on, there we go. So, uh, give you a little details on my implementation of this that I call BISC, uh, just because it rhymes with RISC and CISC, and I thought it was clever. And I like saying like iPhone BISC or Windows BISC. It's like a lob like a lobster BISC, <laughs> kind of tasty. Um, which stands for a borrowed instruction synthetic computer, which is kind of a backronym. I thought of the the name before I found out what it stood for. And that's actually version two of what it stands for. I think I like it better. Um, so basically what BISC is, is BISC is a small Ruby library for demonstrating how to build borrowed instruction programs. Notice I now say borrowed instructions, not return-oriented programs. Because return-oriented programming must be Turing-complete, according to Hovavshikam, the author of it. So um, I don't support branches or conditionals. So I'm gonna call these a borrowed instruction program. Um, because for evading depth and stuff like that, we don't actually need conditionals. We don't need loops. Who cares? But I want my exploit to work. So the design ideas are one, keep it simple so it works, um, and try and make it easy to use. And so I, to do that, I made it analogous to a traditional assembler. Like you write your return or your borrowed instruction program in real x86 assembly. And the assembler kind of uh, just translates that into return addresses of those instructions so that it basically does what you write. And also try to minimize the amount of magic behind the scenes and also allow users to write macros to uh, make their life a little easier. So here's kind of a compare contrast of ROP versus BISC. They both reuse single instructions followed by a return. Um, ROP composes instruction sequences into gadgets. Um, BISC doesn't, you have to write you know, your code in individual instructions. Uh, ROP is Turing complete. BISC isn't. Um, 
BISC is opportunistic based on the instructions available. So depending on the target, you may have to do things a little differently because 